Ladies and gentlemen, uh, part two of the morning session. Um, we would also then close the, the scientific uh, program of the first week of uh, BCBT. Um, and then after that we have lunch and you guys go for your projects. Uh, oh no, tutorial, there's one more IQR tutorial this afternoon. No, IQR tutorial this afternoon. Um, and then the beach party. But in between all of that and now, Stands Giovanni Maffei. Uh, Giovanni is also a member of FEX, is still for a few days because he is, he is uh, escaping. Uh, but that's good, right? Um, the world changes. Uh, and Giovanni has done great work, as you know, on one of motor control. Right? You have, you've heard his work on, on HSPC, these sort of hierarchies of, of forward models that are coupled through uh, counterfactual error. But what he's going to talk about now is not the counterfactual error, right? The real stuff. It's real. It's true. It's perspective error. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so this is again into cranial work. But now we'll look at the other end of the system, right? So Daniel was telling us really about how does the human brain, how does the human brain store information and recall And Giovanni is looking at the part where you really transform it again in a decision. So he's very much in the similar domain where Aaron was yesterday when he talked about the redness potential and volition. So Giovanni's looking at a very similar system, but he's looking at it from a somewhat different perspective, which is showing us really some of the deep secrets of how our brains generate action. So let's see if Giovanni is able to share these deep secrets with all of us. I'll do my best. Good. Um, first of all, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, also, thanks for uh, spoiling my change of plans. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say it's a very big honor to be on this stage um, because I've been uh, in the audience of this VT for like perhaps like six years now. No, you're not being honest. You have been showing up late for all the lectures of these I've been showing up late for the last six years. So it's frankly <laughs> also your fault because you're getting so many at the host so and that's why. Like, so you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a big honor because I started in the audience when I was um, a research assistant at SPACS, or maybe still master student. Um, now I'm on this stage presenting my work in a plenary session uh, as a postdoc, and this is like a great honor. Um, especially because this is a great school that Anna always puts a lot of effort. So, uh, a great emotion to be here. Uh, today, uh, I, will, I will be talking about a phenomenon, a specific type of behavior that entails change of plans, and how a specific areas in the media frontal cortex, and specifically in the human frontal areas, that uh, might support this behavior through um, oscillatory dynamics. So, um, then to start, um, and to link back also like, to what we have discussed during the tutorial the other day, uh, we discussed like, at the very beginning of the tutorial that one of the key features of uh, biological behavior is that it's extremely flexible. So animals and humans have evolved to behave in real time, in the real world, so they can act and adapt in real time, they can generalize uh, what they have learned and also like aggressively switch uh, across uh, multiple behaviors, and they are robust uh, to novelty and handle well exceptions. So um, we also discussed that um, this ability mostly relies on um, the coexistence of multiple control systems in the brain. Um, uh, these are like notions that emerged like, uh, uh, along decades of research in experimental psychology, cognitive science, uh, neuroeconomics as well, and, and neuroscience. And that somehow has agreed like, on the, these four partitions of like, reflexive behavior and anticipatory that we have discussed in the tutorial the other day. Um, and also two other systems, the procedural and deliberate system that we're going to uh, be discussing today. Um, remember, like, all of them uh, contribute to action. It's a very important to, like, to take this system level perspective like, to understand how the interface between these two systems happens. This is what I'm precisely going to try to address today from a, a neurophysiological perspective. But before we get into the uh, results, let's uh, uh, all get to the same page and let's uh, figure out what deliberation means. So, um, I guess you, especially the 
uh, new people that came here uh, on purpose for this CD, you will have been in this situation. The first day that you came here to the summer school, uh, you had the goal to uh, reach this building on time, um, but you pretty much didn't know how to get it, right? So, you just need to think, think hard to use all the tools that you've been empowered with, like Google Maps, for example, to figure out what was the best roads to get there, um, and the most efficient to get there on time, and then finally, uh, you figured out your way to the, to the top, you got your um, croissant, and that was a positive reinforcement, uh, you achieved your goal, and, um, and, and the task was done. So, deliberation basically means that whenever the system or the brain sets some specific goal, we need like an explicit representation of um, our environment and our actions and an explicit evaluation process that can tell us whether what we're doing is correct or not. Okay. Then, a couple of weeks later, um, you pretty much don't go through this evaluation process anymore. Now, your actions are encoded into proceedings. Right? So instead of like opening Google Maps or like figuring out where to go um, and evaluating all the time whether you're going through the best route, you're probably just like walking uh, through the usual path, you're just gonna turn left at the corner, then go right and enter the hole, etc. without thinking too much. Right? Now, the cool thing about the procedure system that has learned this procedure is that unlike the, uh, the delivery system, it also works for young and old. So basically, it then offloads the system from uh, specific like uh, cognitive costs and encodes everything into something that basically can run automatically. Okay. Now, um, there is like this notion that the procedural system somehow progressively acquires knowledge about what to do in specific contexts from the delivered system. So while the delivered system has to figure out like the optimal solution in a specific novel situation, the more you repeat, let's say, the same pattern of behavior, the more this pattern shifts from the deliberate system to the procedural system. So deliberate and procedural systems in the brain, they have like a specific characterization. And uh, in this cartoon, um, from this nature neuroscience review, uh, there are like at least like these two uh, different uh, neural networks, so neural circuits that underlying deliberate and procedural control. On one hand, we have like a so-called associative circuit that mainly relies on uh, frontal cortices and uh, uh, descending uh, nuclei to the basal ganglia and the striatum and that moving back to the thalamus. And uh, the motor uh, circuits, or the, the motor network, that includes more like procedures, that mostly rely, or the sensory motor network, it's called, mostly uh, uh, relies on the, on the motor circuits and another part of the striatum of the basal ganglia that is called the decam. So these are like differential, uh, differential circuits. Um, this um, uh, theory is like, pretty much consolidated. It's supported by um, uh, a variety of data. Like, this is like a classic paper from Miyashi, uh, from the Kozaka lab in 2002 where um, the study, they recorded from the macaque striped and neurons. And um, while the, the monkey had like, to perform um, a, a motor adaptation task, so he had to learn a sequence of actions. No? So you have like, to think about like, learning a sequence of actions in these regards, it's like, pretty much like what you would do uh, while like, walking from your home or your hotel to a bank. No, it's just like the larger scale sequence of action that is just collapsed into like something like very small, like tapping uh, um, uh, buttons on a keyboard. But like the concept is pretty much the same, right? So if you have like to learn the sequence of action for the first time, you would basically you would have like follow some cue, and this is what happens. So on the on the keyboard there are like the cue buttons and the monkey has to follow them. But then after a number of repetitions, of course the the the, the sequence is learned. So, um, if you now record like from the uh, from the neurons in the in the frame, you see that uh, you can uh, basically find neurons that are like a, uh, preferably encoding either new sequences or learned sequences, right? And now, if you look at these neurons, like when you uh, 
uh, learn a new sequence, you see that like when the new you're exposed to a new sequence, the new tuned neurons are active, while the learned tuned neurons are silent. But whenever you have learned, now the new tuned neurons are silent, and the learned neurons are active. So this suggests that there are like neurons that are more responsible for encoding and learning new sequences, others that are more responsible to retain those, those, those modern sequences, and basically they have like complementary and non-overlapping goals. Okay? Now, if we look at the location of these neurons, we see that these neurons are uh, pretty much located in two different circuits, so we have a majority of the new encoding neurons in the associative circuit, and uh, a majority of the um, learned uh, encoding neurons in the sensory motor circuit. And this somehow supports the idea that there's like a progressive shift of knowledge from uh, the associative circuits, so the, the, the deliberate network, to the sensory motor network. Okay? Uh, more than from a frontal areas to more sensory motor. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to have to dig too much into how Um, that deliberate knowledge progressively shifts to, to the procedural system, but if you're interested in that, there are uh, pretty interesting uh, and enlightening reviews. A classic one from uh, Anne Craigier, and a more recent one from uh, uh, the Rukovsta lab. Um, it's pretty much we get you like, on the same page on what's going on in this very like, exciting uh, field, field of study. Now, um, one key aspect like to uh, understand the interaction, uh, the system level interaction between deliberate and, uh, and procedural control, is like to try to understand what are the mechanisms that orchestrate these two systems, right? Now we know that there's like a, pretty much like a shift of, uh, of information from one to the other, but what are the mechanisms that somehow orchestrate, like when does one act, when the other one is supposed to act? What, what are the mechanisms that orchestrate? Now, to, to answer this question, um, uh, a, a typical task that you would find like, in, a, in, a, in a experimental psychology and, and a, in cognitive science is the so-called change of plan task. Now, the change of plan task has the goal to try to create a conflict between procedural and deliberate control. So that if you create a conflict, you're going to be able like, to dissociate what is the intervention of one. Right? Now, uh, keeping the same condition as before, um, you are now going again to BCPT after uh, the APO, and uh, you're just walking there, you must be relying on your procedural system, but at that point, you find a detour. So the road that you're typically taking is blocked. So do you do that? Well, the system at that point needs somehow to recalibrate, right? I mean, we've been using like one of these. Uh, old-fashioned GPS, as long before everything was uh, in, in the phone, and they were telling you, like, I lost the signal, I have to repair it. So that's pretty much like what you would expect to happen in the brain at some point whenever you find the violation of your expectations, right? So at that point, you would expect the procedure system to just leave space back to the deliberate or the deliberate part of the core, and to figure out uh, a new solution to go back to your group. So, when you find it, that's funny you're happy, you figure out, but the real the key point of the change of plan task is we want to observe what happens in the transition between one and the other. And also what are like the areas of the brain that are uh, involved in this in this decision. Now, there is a classic study from Kosaka, uh, Missionary Science 2007, where they precisely designed the task to test this. So in here, like a macaque had to um, gaze towards one or the other side. Okay, so there's a fixation point in the middle, the macaque has to gaze towards one side or uh, towards the other, depending on the fixation cue that you get here in the middle. Okay? Now, uh, this is a high repetitive task that in the first sense has to in, in, induce automation in the macaque. Okay? So, the macaque repeats the same action all over. Now, the target is always the same. It always has to get to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left, to the left. What happens when you start repeating all over this action, you see that you have like a massive decrease in reaction times. 
That means that the action is progressively being automated. Okay? So the macaque at this point is not caring anymore too much on what is the instruction in the middle because it's always the same. So at this point, we're just going to look at the left, look at the left, look at the left. But at some point, the fixation cube changes, and the macaque has to look to the other. Okay. And these are like the specific trials, or the change of plan trials, where we would expect the system to switch back to a uh, more controlled mode. Okay? Because now contingencies have changed. I have to recalibrate and refigure out like, a new type of What you observe is that in these trials, you have like, a big increase of reaction times. And this is something that also in the uh, Cognitive science research is called like switch post. And uh, this somehow suggests that uh, higher reaction times might imply the intervention of like higher cognitive areas. No? So there's like long, longer process in time. Um, the key finding from, uh, from this study is that neurons in the uh, supplementary motor areas of the so supplementary motor areas are um, the part of the uh, medial frontal cortex. So it's basically like the strip of cortex that sits right in front of the motor cortex, and it's divided into laterally in the pre-motor cortex and medially in supplementary motor areas and uh, slightly uh, more advanced, you have like three supplementary motor okay? So neurons in this area, <coughs> supplementary motor high field, like recorded, remember this is a gazing class, um, have been recorded and have been characterized. So, um, Basically, what you observe is that like, there's no activity of these neurons whenever the monkey is just uh, performing a non-switch trial. So whenever like, the system is habituated, these neurons are basically doing it. But whenever you switch, so you switch trials, then you see the activity of the neurons increases. And we can actually even differentiate between uh, switch trials correct and switch trial errors. Depending on the activity and the rise the, and, and the amplitude of the activity of these neurons. Okay? So whenever these neurons are able to kick in in the right moment, now with the right strength, now then the system is able to switch. Otherwise, uh, the, the trial is missed. Okay? So this basically suggests that uh, um, neurons in, in this area seems to be critical for switching between procedure and delivery control. And um, as a sort of just like anatomical speculation, uh, it's also like pretty much like the optimal position where you would put a controller of this kind, right? Because as, as we as we seen earlier, uh, this this specific area see, seems to sit at the interface between the frontal associative circuit and the motor sensory motor circuit, right? So if I if I were like to to, to design the brain, like I would probably put like controller of this kind, of like that. But this is like my speculation. Um, do you guys have any questions about this part? So clear? Fantastic. So, um, whenever we go to the human brain, however, like, the role of supplementary motor areas like, remains unclear. Uh, this is like, because typically, we don't really have access to the, uh, the super resolution that we get like, in, a, in, in animal operations. And also because there's like, quite a bit of an unclarity you know, with respect like, to um, whether SMAs are involved like in fine tuning motor behavior or they're involved in inhibiting action or promoting actions. And especially like what is not clear is like what are the mechanisms that in human SMAs might be supporting uh, switching behavior. Uh, this is something that we mostly have findings from either EG or fMRI you know, that are not uh, conclusive. So um, these are like some questions that like in, in, the, in the debate of like um, uh, SMA in a change of plan task that like we should, should be addressed. Now, talking about humans, one of the um, uh, most uh, famous and important tasks like, to induce automation in the, in the procedural system is a serial reaction plan task. So this task is very simple. Um, you basically just have like, to perform a huge sequence of motor actions. So, uh, you have like some cues that correspond like, to your finger that appear on the screen, and they light up in sequence. And you just have like to press the corresponding uh, key, right? To the key. And the sequence just repeats all over. Now, if we have to condition in the series in the task, there is like a random condition where like the sequence just goes on at random. 
so it's unpredictable. And a repeat condition where, where the sequence indeed repeats cyclically. Now, what you would expect if you believe like this uh, transition no, from the deliberate to, uh, to the procedure system is that when things are predictable, the reaction times tend to drop over blocks, right? So the system somehow starts acquiring this sensory motor knowledge that links one step to the other, and things start getting very, very, very fast. Okay? So indeed, if you check like the, the reaction times, this is like pretty much also close to subconscious perception. So this goes very fast. Well, in a, in the random condition, this doesn't happen. So this like, the serial reaction time task is a, is a task that uh, is known to induce automation. And we're going to be using uh, this task later on in, in our setup as a starting point to investigate uh, the change of plans in the human. Um, so, precisely, um, now we're going to need a little bit more in, uh, in our work that we've done during the uh, As I said, like, starting like, from a stuff like this, uh, we went to oncology and they had to undergo uh, surgery. So, uh, when they undergo surgery, they are implanted with electrodes in the brain in different areas, like from medical uh, purposes, because they want to monitor uh, intracranial activity, but you also want to uh, stimulate to uh, figure out where it's like the center, no, or the focus of the OBDN. Now, these patients are uh, typically in the hospital for some time, no, and uh, they are basically just sitting in the bed, no, and it's somehow like a good occasion like, for us to want to study the human brain, to um, just let them or us to collaborate in our studies and do like different community tasks. No, this is like what Daniel did like memory tasks. Um, I uh, focus more on uh, decision and task and changing. Um, so, as I was saying, we designed a task that is pretty much based on the <coughs> serial reaction time task. Uh, it was a tablet based version of it. Uh, also convenient to uh, so uh, the hospital. Uh, in here, uh, the idea of the task is like pretty much what I've told you before. There is a keyboard and uh, uh, there is one uh, target key that lights up at every step of the sequence. The goal of the task is like simply to just follow the tap on that specific key. Okay? It's like five steps, um, it's guided by this visual cue, and it repeats all over. So, um, if we look at behavior, like while uh, the patients or the subjects are uh, learning the sequence, we see like the uh, typical drop in uh, uh, sequence uh, response time, uh, total sequence production time that you would expect from the serial reaction time task, is that uh, over uh, 60 training trials, uh, we have uh, a little bit of uh, variability, and not all the patients necessarily which seem to be also have like this. Bear in mind that these patients are also treated pharmacologically, so they're expected to be a little bit slower than than, uh, than, than uh, healthy subjects. But nevertheless, like we detect learning, we detect like a, a, a significant difference between the inter-key intervals. So basically, like how much time you take to tap from one key to the other, uh, from early to late trials. Uh, this is like, pretty much like what you. Uh, Behavioral literature would expect to see uh, during uh, uh, automation of, of motor response. Okay? Do you guys have any questions on this? So, here? Yes, from Rome in the back? Yes? Um, so, we, um, based on this task, we then later introduced our change of plans. So, what we did is that in a second uh, block that after the training phase. In uh, during random trials and during like random steps of the sequence, we intersparse a uh, switch queue. So the switch queue is nothing else that whenever you are performing your stereotype habitual se sequence, at some point the switch queue appears. It's like what the key that you're pressing just turns on. Okay. Now your goal is instead of like going on the sequence that you can learn. You have like to stop, halt that procedural behavior, and you press and uncue the key. So the reason why the so this is like the sequence just the, uh, the switch queue appears. You have like to press 
somewhere else on the keyboard that you have been told at the very beginning. Okay? So the setup is not telling you where to press. It's just telling you you have to switch. Okay? This is a very important point that I think it's also like a, quite a bit of difference with, uh, with respect to the concept of task because in this case, you somehow have to minimally deliberate on what you're supposed to do. Right? You have like, to remember, like, what did this guy tell me you know, at the very beginning? What was the instruction? What am I supposed to do when this thing appears? Right? So, um, is it clear so far? Yes. Okay. So, of course, you might be asking, like, what happens during switch trials? So, from a behavior perspective, what we observe is that we see like, a massive increase in response time uh, during switch trials. This is something that, if you remember the monkeys from Ikozaka, that's pretty much what you would expect from this. Uh, this is something that, in uh, 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 cognitive science and experimental psychology, there is called switch cost. There's a whole review by Monson from 2003 about it. And this is like, pretty much like a sort of behavioral signature that uh, suggests the involvement of um, slower, <coughs> perhaps more deliberate processes in control. Okay. A second observation that will be crucial for our study is um, that uh, subjects show pretty much like a spontaneous variability in the re response time of switch. Okay. So this means that sometimes switch actions are very fast. Sometimes switch actions are very simple. Very, I mean, relatively to the distribution. Also, they may range from 0.6 uh, seconds to 1.8. It's like almost an outlier, but just like to give you an idea of what is the standard emission. Okay? And now, of course, if you do all your controls, so if you're doing your kosher analysis, uh, you have to filter out like, other possible explanations. So, so you can, basically, we, what we did was like, just check whether, like, the, is, is there anything in the task or in the design that is inducing this variability? Perhaps, like, the position of the of the uh, of the of the switch signal, uh, or the type of sequence that uh, the subjects are performing. But indeed, none of them can explain this variability. Okay. So this idea pretty much suggests that this deliberate system in itself has some jitter, so sometimes it's more effective, sometimes it's less effective. Okay. And this is like something that perhaps uh, is worth to try to explain, right? Um, so, but before going to that, I think like the key question that we would like to answer is like, first of all, checking what are the areas that are involved in switch. So can we detect what is the deliberate uh, controller in, in the brain? Uh, what areas are responding to the task? So to do this, we perform um, um, a, a, a classification uh, technique. So we use a classification technique, uh, basically trying um, to detect the responsive electrodes through classification. Now, the idea here is that uh, to so in, let's say in a, in a typical like uh, neurophysiological stuff, you would just like, implant some electrode in some specific area. I would confidently just say that it, this area is responsible for this behavior. Okay. But when you go to an intracranial setup where you have like quite a big variability and a lot of contact points involved, just like arbitrarily selecting an electrode that tells you that you think is going to be involved of an area that you think is going to be involved in the task. It's definitely a biased selection, you know, and we want to avoid that from the very beginning. So, an unbiased way to look at it is try to use a classification method that tries to classify the task. Okay? So, now we have two types of trials. Right? You remember we have automatic trials and switch trials. Okay? Now, what we want to do is like, to look at the activity of, in the brain, so epoch activity. You know, so, we basically chunk the signal in two different um, epochs, so there are trials, and we know like by the design that there are automatically switch trials. And now what we do is that we extract time domain features from the signal. So basically where 
compressing a description of the Sina into like a much smaller representation that basically just describes like um, uh, where uh, so where like the fluctuations what we are doing uh, in practice is like fitting uh, alpha functions in the Sina and basically getting the um, the parameters of this. So now we have like sort of compressed description of this of each epoch and to each epoch we are assigning the label of the trial. Okay, so we give one if it's a switch trial and zero if it's a if it's an automatic trial. Okay, and then we stack all the epochs into a matrix and we pass it to a, a classifier. Like in this case, we use a, 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 a supervector machines. And basically, what you want to do is that you want to ask for each contact point, so each area of the brain, how well that area classifies the task, right? Because if we can find the difference between the activity, in the activity between the switch and automatic trials, it means that that area somehow is involved in the switch. Are you with me? Yes. Is it clear for everyone? Like the reason behind it? Okay. So, um, crucially, we find that, so we, we perform like this analysis on all, all the contact points. Okay? Um, now, we also sort of like, uh, first contact points uh, uh, per Broadman area. So, basically, also thanks to Tony, uh, we were able like, to trace back like, the location of each individual contact point in each individual vector into uh, specific uh, atlases. In this case, we use, Bro we use Broadman. And then we did this classification and tried to figure out what Broadman area best describes it as. Now, the, the, the nice thing is that like, uh, for all the three subjects that we have been utilizing, the area 6 media seems to be the one that has the highest uh, classification accuracy. Yeah. Um, so, um, we have like other areas that also light up. Um, in uh, uh, this patient, area 35 is the insula. We don't really know why. The rest like, pretty much gets like the uniform. In this case, we have some contribution from the uh, temporal lobe that I thought it was like, completely mysterious, but turns out, yes, with Alan, is a pretty uh, common uh, signature to see in cognitive control. Uh, so the temporal lobe always lights up in some way. So we don't know why. Maybe Danny one day will, will tell us why. Uh, this patient had like a quite a massive uh, implant and, uh, and resolution in a more motor areas. So you can see like area three and area four, uh, the, the, the motor cortex. Okay, so you would expect to see like. Uh, more classification accuracy in, in motor areas. But what, what really matters here is that uh, area 6 media is the one that best classifies the task. And area 6 media <coughs> in Broadman Atlas is indeed <coughs> supplementary motor areas. Okay? So now we are allowed to pick uh, specific contact points from that area and analyze those because we know that these are those that best respond to them. Um, do you guys have questions on this? No? Is it all clear? Okay. So, someone might ask, okay, show us the thing. Right? You want to see what's going on in there. Okay, here. Um, so now, uh, if you now take the contact points, now the best classified task, what do you basically see? by comparing switch and habitual, uh, I, I tend to use habitual or automatic in a sort of inter interchangeable way. Sorry for this. Um, if you compare these two types of trials, and, uh, you look at the, basically what you do is like you look at the nearest signal, you align it to the motor, the, to the final key press. Okay? Bear in mind that in an automatic uh, sequence, the final key press is the last key press of the automatic sequence, but the last key press in a switch trial is the, when, you have, when you have switched to the alternative action. Okay? So now we're like locking them to the, to the key press, and we know that like in one case you have switched in the other one. You have. And now, uh, this is like a mean of the mean, so we made a mean of all the switch trials and automatic trials for each patient, and then of these means we made another mean uh, to uh, to give like some sort of like global mean of, of, of the group. 
And what you see is that while in habitual trials we have like very, very little modulation, and perhaps maybe even just like random fluctuations, if you remember the word from yesterday. In, uh, in C trials we have like uh, quite nice and uh, well defined uh, neural. Okay. So now, here's the difference. And if you believe that this is something that has to do with motor control, then you might define it as a motor related cortical potential. Motor related cortical potential is just like a broader class of motor potentials of which the readiness potential we were talking about yesterday belongs to. Okay? And this is something like detectable in supplementary motor areas and later in the, in the motor. So, if you believe this, then um, the peak of these uh, uh, responses perhaps like action initiation. So, we have like quite a big difference now between these two, uh, two trials. Um, if you want to go a little bit more in depth into what it is, this is a little bit speculative now, but first, you need to characterize in some way what, what the signal is. So, you remember yesterday, uh, we looked at, ah, sorry, and another thing that I want to say, this should be uh, negative and positive, sorry, so it should be flipped upside down. Um, uh, in this case, it's actually flipped upside down. This is like a, a typical like readiness potential that you see like in stuff like, like yesterday, with this uh, very, very uh, long attack. But in this uh, study from back in 2007, I think it's actually a review, uh, they make a clear difference between um, the readiness potential of a pre-planned act. So you just basically like planning and then the thing rises and then just uh, acting, and a non-pre-planned act. So basically the non-pre-planned act that is like some response like to some external stimulus is uh, pretty much what I think we're looking at here. So it's missing like this uh, uh, slow rise attack. Here the timings are a little, little bit shorter in our case, but you see that this has like pretty much like the same uh, shape that you would expect like, from a motor response. And here we have our uh, action initiation detected as an e e EMG signature. Okay. So from now on, I'm going to be talking about uh, action initiation, meaning that I take the peak of this specific signal. Okay. Do you guys have questions on this? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the peak, the red, uh, the, the green one, and if I'm so well, it's during the movement. It's during the movement mm -hmm. because you're locked at the key press, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, um, is it related to the uh, encoding of the movement, the climbing of the movement is going through? So, is that what you're doing? Or do you think it could be related to the encoding and more abstract level of the switch of the rule? It's uh, yeah, more abstract layer. Yes. Um, Thank you for this question. This is like a, perhaps the key yeah. of this talk. Okay. Uh, I anticipate <laughs> that uh, I will not have a clear answer to this. Okay. Uh, so I will have like, to fill in with a little bit of speculation. Okay. But this is like. I think one of the key points that we're trying to address. Okay. Thank you, like, also for pointing out something that... Um, so this is the key press, right? Um, but we say action incision is here. So what's happening here in the middle? Uh, yeah, so this is like uh, pretty much like a... I wouldn't call it an artifact, but it's, it's, it's induced by our setup in the sense that if you're sitting in a hospital bed and you have like to move your arm, etc. that takes some time, you know, so uh, typically, of course, if you have like a very, very well-controlled laboratory conditions, you would like to have like immediate reaction times, you know, so someone is like placed there with their fingers on the keyboard, you know, as soon as something happens, presses, etc. and that you would have like much uh, smaller latency. Uh, I think that this is like pretty much just explained by the, the fact that you have like, to physically move the arm you know, from one place to the other, and this has uh, like and it's like a free, 300 milliseconds of latency. Um, th I think this makes sense. Um, so, uh, moving on. How am I doing with time? Great. Go ahead. I'm doing fine, okay, perfect. 
So now we have like 100 slides more. So. <laughs> um, so, um, of course, like, uh, going further, now pretty much also in the direction that you're suggesting, is like, we could start asking where are the aspects of the neural signal that encode the parameters of speech action execution. So what's there in the signal that can tell us about uh, the way you act when uh, you, you act in a, in a, in a deliberate way? So, the uh, first thing to do, like still uh, staying like, in the pure like, uh, time domain, is by <coughs> looking at the temporal uh, properties of, this, uh, of this, uh, this response and basically measuring how much time that takes to rise from the moment that I present you the switch queue. Okay? So, um, this is something that I call time to peak. Okay? The time starts at the queue presentation. The peak is when you detect the peak of the uh, motor evoked potential. Uh, this is like uh, the raw signal. Um, of this is uh, one uh, patient uh, example. It is now locked at the queue. Uh, these are like, this is like the raw signal. This is the mean of the signal. Uh, this is a low pass version of it. And then we basically apply a peak detection method to uh, detect where is like the biggest peak like, from, from here. Okay. Um, now, if you try to relate uh, this uh, lag, so is it clear what the time to peak is? Yes? Okay, so now we want to try to relate this with a, with a performance. Okay? Because of course someone could ask, like, maybe this is just a random fluctuation, right? I mean, we have heard about random fluctuation uh, the, whole, the whole day yesterday, you know, so uh, it's, it would be a fair question. No? Um, so now you try to relate the time to peak uh, from the queue presentation to response time, you get like a, a pretty good uh, peak. So these are like uh, Pearson correlation coefficients. Uh, for one patient, you get like 0.7, the other are around 0.5. Of course, we have like a, a little bit of expected variability, but it's like pretty much like what we can conclude from this is that. This, uh, uh, this, this narrow signature that we're observing uh, in some way must relate to action, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't find this, this, this relation. You know? So whether this is like the motor system that kicks out something or like it's encoding like some uh, action parameter, in some way, whenever this thing rises, you know, like the, the motor system starts to design, okay? Because then you, you find it. Um, do you guys have questions for this? This result is clear? You're so damn clear, Giovanni. Okay. I can't believe it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, a, a second question that you can ask, like still like uh, sticking like, to the pure time, is whether the amplitude of the signal explains motor behavior. Because, of course, like, one possibility is that, like, perhaps, like, whenever like, the signal like, spikes up like, very high, that's encoding directly a motor uh, action, then perhaps you would act faster. You know? But if the signal is weaker, you, know, you would be you would take more time to, let's say, cross this threshold. You know? If you believe in crossing thresholds, you know, then things like should spike up, like uh, higher. You know? um, so some, the same thing that you can do now, like you're just basically measuring uh, the peak of the this uh, motor evoked response. Uh, with respect to baseline, and then you want to try to relate that to action. Um, if you do that, you get a pretty poor right? So, um, in, in, in one case, you get like a 0.3 correlation. Uh, in the other, this is like might be significant. In the other cases, you get like non significant that. I think it pretty much suggests that although this uh, specific um, uh, motor evoked response that we observe relates to action in some way, the symbol like time domain description doesn't really seem to encode any specific action for me. Right? This is a uh, uh, further proof of this is that you can try to fit the linear model uh, in between response time and some of the features that you have extracted. Uh, and you see like how well uh, this feeds, so these are like the temporal features like time from peak and time to peak, 
and this is uh, amplitude, and you see that like, uh, R squared is like much higher for uh, uh, for the temporal, but but very low like for for amplitude features. Okay? So um, now when we saw this, uh, we were uh, a little bit puzzled because in fact, if you look at like uh, this is like a quite well known paper like from the Journal of Neuroscience. What you would expect is, in fact, like a modulation of peak activity uh, depending on response time. Okay? So this means like, uh, this is like a similar uh, setup. Uh, it's uh, indeed, I think, uh, it's, some, uh, it's also like a switch task depending on like some potential feature. Basically what they record in the media from the cortex to EEG is that slow trials have like much less magnitude to them. Than, uh, than fast trials. Okay. So this is like something that we were expecting to see in our setup, but in fact it didn't really show up. Uh, we did something similar. We didn't really divide into quartiles. So we just like uh, made a medium split on fast and slow trials, and then uh, we compared the, the two signals that now are aligned to the peak. So basically, what you're doing is like you're taking all these peaks and you're just like aligning them. So then now all the trials are aligned to uh, action execution or action initiation. Uh, and then basically you can just compare like the, the two type of trials, so fast and, uh, and slow trials. And basically, this is like a mean, again, a mean of the mean. Okay? So we take the patients, we make a mean of fast and slow for each patient, and then we make a mean of the mean, and this is like the mean of the group. Okay? And basically what you see is that like, these two signatures for fast and slow trials are pretty much identical. Okay? So if you remember yesterday, uh, Alan uh, showed something similar. Uh, I think it was both modeling and, uh, and, um, uh, and simulation. He showed that depending on like, the fluctuation state that the system is in a specific moment, you know, then if you sort trials into fast and slow trials, and you compare the signal, basically you see that like, fast trials start like, from a much higher baseline than slow trials. Right? And then, therefore, you, you, you can basically detect like a difference you know, in the in the rising activity here. Now, of course, like we see something here. This is like no, it's non significant. So if you do like then all the statistics, no uh, permutation analysis for for each patient, basically like here you, do, you don't get. You know, this is like, just to say that this is like pretty much the, the, the same the same thing. Okay. Um, do you guys have questions on this? No. So now, if I were you, well, first, uh, intermediate summary. So we have devised this uh, uh, switching task. We uh, observe the subjects can switch from automatic to deliberate action, but at a greater cost. Greater cost means higher reaction time. Now, um, SMA seem to be involved in switching and shows signature consistent with the idea that this could be a motor uh, about potential. Um, <coughs> now the, the, the temporal features of the motor work potential seems to relate to response time, but amplitude unexpectedly doesn't. Okay. So this, of course, uh, raises like a further question: that is like, okay, where is the um, the details of motor response that can explain behavior um, are perhaps hidden in some other features of this? Okay. So now. A little digression, we are embracing like a, a rather uh, new hypothesis and set of evidence that show that TIT oscillations, the same TIT oscillations that you observe in the hippocampus and the temporal lobe that underlie uh, memory formation, seem also to entrain frontal networks. Okay? And especially during cognitive control. So, uh, do you guys have clear what we mean with oscillations? Who doesn't have clear what we mean with oscillation? You guys what? Yeah, I don't know what you mean with oscillations. So okay. So, <laughs> well, uh, fortunately, you came into BCBT this year, so. <laughs> so, it was free, you know? Huh? Yeah, it was free. Exactly. It was free coffee. Free coffee. <laughs> and good person. Uh, so, what we mean with oscillation is like pretty much this. So, uh, you take a oscillatory signal, no, so you assume the signal of the brain is like oscillatory, stationary. And um, now what you can do is like, of course you can look at the raw signal, but 
you can basically assume that the sigma is uh, a linear combination of uh, sinusoids, right? <coughs> that run at different frequencies. Huh? So we have. Um, can I take out this? It's not very, very insightful. Drum. Oh no! Sorry, did you? Oh, get it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna draw it back. <coughs> it didn't look that informative, I should say. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. So, if you sum them up, basically what you do is like you get something like all this very messy, and then I say, oh, the P is, you know? So, it's like, now the assumption is like, can we decompose this into a set of oscillations? Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So the idea now is that you can use techniques uh, like a wave, wavelet transform or um, uh, multi taper analysis that uh, preserve like time frequency uh, descriptions of the signal. Okay. So basically, what we do is like we try to guess how to fit sinusoidals into this messy signal. You know? So now I'm going to have like a bank of sinusoidals with different properties, and I'm going to try to fit them in such a way that I get like the decomposition of the signal into all these sinusoidals. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. Now, what you do next, now you have more descriptors, right? So basically what you do is like, Besides the frequency, no? so now you have like a fast sinusoidal, a slow sinusoidal, this is a typically measured in hertz. But this is measured in hertz. Mm -hmm. um, that is like cycles per second. Okay, so one hertz means that like you do one cycle in one second. And 50 hertz means that you do 50 cycles in one second. Um, other things that you can basically come up with to describe the signal now is like amplitude and phase. Okay? So amplitude is like how much the oscillation goes up, okay? so the magnitude. The phase is uh, describes more like the, the temporal properties, so like the, sh the shift that we have like, with respect to the object. Okay? And while I'm describes like how much the oscillation grows, uh, the phase in itself is useful to relate like to other oscillation to decide whether things are synchronized or not. Right? Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So if two things are perfectly in phase, no, like with respect to that, they're perfectly synchronized, they can be anti-phased or whatever. No? But this is like uh, bear in mind like it's a it's a, it's a, it's a way to like describe like um, the activity in the brain, especially when you work with LFPs, to detect whether like even multiple areas of the brain are synchronized or communicating, etc. So it's like a, a very, very standard way to do that. Now, um, there are like a couple of studies that I think they're very representative of, of this. Like, uh, the, the role of like theta oscillations in cognitive control. Uh, sorry, do you have questions on the previous, previous point? So clear? Okay. Elise is clear? Yes. Yes? Uh, now, uh, let's look at these uh, theta oscillations in the brain. Um, uh, there's this uh, very nice analytics paper from Bolo where they get a monkey to do a um, uh, shift attention task. So the monkey has two targets and it's cued on what target it should covertly attend. Okay? And now it has to answer about the target. Okay? But then you try to distract the monkey you know, by showing like, something else on the other side. You know? And now the monkey has to cognitively control how to uh, um, uh, allocate attention or resources either to one target or the other. Okay? Does it make sense? So it's like if I'm speaking and you desperately want to listen to my talk, but there's Adrian that keeps speaking, you know, there next to you, then you're like, okay, I have like a feature of Adrian trying to listen to Javan. You know? So that's pretty much like the same idea. Now if you record in the latter prefrontal cortex, so first like the monkey has to answer some question about the target. Um, now, what you can do is like, then look at the oscillatory patterns in the lateral prefrontal cortex, and especially you can compare the phase of the oscillation. No? In this case, the phase is expressed in a, a circular terms, so phase is expressed like in a spins or in degrees. And now, 
what you can, what you see is that like for correct trials where the monkey has correctly shifted attention to the target trial, we see that um, stereotypical face profile, right? The, now you, you you sum up all the trials now and you see that like the signal in uh, in, uh, in the frontal cortex has somehow reset, right? Like so from messy oscillation, etc. When something happens, pop, all the signals for a while start going like this, right? Pretty much. This is like something that's called phase reset. It means like whatever phase you are in this moment, whenever something happens, you cut below. Okay? And this is like correct trials. In other trials, we don't see this. But this happens in theta. And this suggests that this oscillation in theta can be uh, somehow supporting like encoding you know, of like specific uh, uh, cognitive signals you know, that, that are propagated for shifting stage. Now, um, this monkey, but uh, this uh, similar um, phenomenon has been studied also in humans since the uh, 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 missionary science from 2015. They uh, also use an intracranial setup. This time is E-code. So instead of having uh, intracranial induct electrode, they have like uh, a sheet of electrode that covers like a part of the brain. So they have like pretty much a good spatial uh, resolution on the cortex. And now what they do is like they ask the subjects to perform a uh, decision-making task. And the decision, depending on the condition, is taken with increasingly complex rules. Okay? So from a simple like the Q appears, you have to respond, to if this Q appears, you have to respond this, if that Q appears, you have to respond that. But then things can get like pretty complex. You know? So if inside this box you see two objects and the two objects are of the same shape, then respond this. But if you see in this box these two objects are of the same texture but not the same uh, shape, then it responds something else. Huh? And this gets even more conditional depending on the color of the box that the thing is. So you understand the concept of like higher order rules. No? So you can concatenate if condition, right? Now, the interesting thing is that if you can track the activity from uh, prefrontal uh, cortex to premotor cortex, then what you see is that depending on the difficulty of the task, so we go from like simple sensory motor to um, let's say more cognitive control, you know, where I have like to process higher order rules, I see that the directional influence of prefrontal cortex on the motor system is higher, and it's not just higher, it's higher on the in the theta level. Okay? What does this mean? It means that if now I track the activity in M1 and I look at the spiking oscillatory activity in the very high frequencies, like in the gamma band, that typically are interpreted as local population activity, I see that this is modulated by the theta side. Okay? And this now you can do it directionally to check where is the frontal areas that are influencing the motor cortex in the theta range or the other way around, no? and basically you get like a nice directionality in the sense that it's the frontal cortex that seems to entrain the motor cortex in theta rather than the other way around, okay? So we have like a directionality of information that go like from more uh, pre prefrontal to, to motor areas, okay? Maybe I, you know, how establish the directionality of the interactions? Ah, yeah, so um, basically, uh, so this is a method that is called phase amplitude coupling. Um, phase amplitude coupling looks at so um, it's pretty much like uh, signal processing stuff. Something that if you have studied a little bit of signal processing, like radius uh, works with a, a um, AM and FM. No, it's like this amplitude modulation. AM amplitude modulation. It means that you have like uh, a high frequency wave that carries like some uh, content, and then we have a low frequency wave that modulates that. You know? So now we have high frequency and low frequency. You know? In this case, we have gamma, in this case, we have T. Okay? But what we record at the end is some waves. So it goes up, goes down. Okay? So you see, like, if I press now the envelope of this one, I get a reconstructed. Okay. This means this signal, this signal, high frequency is modulated by this signal. Okay. Now, I can detect this, and I can do it direction. 
So I can say how much the low frequency oscillations in PFC in train high frequency oscillations in M1, right? And I get a score. And then I can do the reverse. Huh? So I can say like how much M1 theta frequency are in train PFC. Right? So that's basically what it is. Um, so cool, no? There are like peak oscillations are like it's like a synthesizer, no? Like in fact, I think uh, Joshua was talking about brain as a synthesizer. I really like that. Um, he talked about anything as a synthesizer. He did. Yeah. No, no, he did. That's so, true. You had modular synthesizers mm -hmm. plugging. Was was it the right? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. 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 Okay. But it's a metaphor, I don't know how far it carries. I think he can go very far. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Much more than what you said at the beginning. Exactly. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying that, uh, like, of course, it, the thing is, if you look at the brain like from an um, LFP perspective, you know, so you are going to detect oscillations and then you end up doing like oscillatory analysis, basically. So uh, this is a little bit imposed if you want by the method itself, but nevertheless, this is like a nice level of description. You know, they can tell us something about like the relationship and between activity in different areas. Also, but this, this definitely is not happening by chance. Okay, whatever that. So now this is like a, a very important point. Do you guys have more questions on this? You guys have to share. Now, um, but uh, this task yes. you talk about the very the complexity of the uh, the rules people to, or the questions people have to answer. Uh, it's the rules that they have to uh, process to answer that question. But it's like the number of rules or the complexity of the rules, or the number of conditions in the rules? How do you mean to control the complexity? Well, the complexity is like the, uh, the order of the rules that you have to uh, attend, right? So there's your order that is like you just press a button, like no matter what. And first order that is like if. Uh, it's right you do this, but then things get like complex. You know? So you start having like uh, little objects inside the squares that are also colored. And so how many levels do they have? Uh, I think they get like up to three or four. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, in fact, four uh, if you start from the northern row. And this is a, this is what you see here. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember R and D what they what they stand for, but. Uh, so uh, this, this is not telling us like much about like uh, how actions are implemented in the in the, in the frontal cortex, but it's telling us something about an influence of more executive or cognitive areas on the motor system. The more things get nested or logically complex. Um, so uh, if you are interested like, in uh, all these uh, drawing body literature, there is a nice review by Patrick and Mike. Uh, from 2016, uh, there's a like, quite comprehensive um, review of like some of these results. Uh, now, uh, for our problem, like now we said, okay, so the oscillations and turn from the circuits. So, however, as I was saying, uh, there's very, very little um, uh, evidence you know, that in fact theta oscillations and oscillations in general can actually act a uh, motor system. To, uh, to implement like action execution. Okay, so we know that there is like a higher uh, modulation if you are responding correctly or not, etc. But like, how does that really relate like, to action? Is like pretty much uh, unknown. Uh, in fact, like the studies that try to relate like uh, action or performance like with uh, with oscillations uh, on, on a continuous on a continuous scale are very few. Maybe you guys know more than that. You, you want to ask something? Yeah. Oh, um, so we, we we decided like to address that question. Now we said that could the oscillations be involved in the control of deliberate motor behavior? That is like linking back to what I was asking before. Is like, um, is it possible that theta oscillatory pattern the same code uh, specific action parameters, no, or might be involved in the uh, in the in the control of, of deliberate uh, action? Um, so, to answer this question, uh, we basically started looking at the relationship of the phases across triangles. Okay? So, it's pretty much the same analysis that these guys were doing here. 
be a member. So correct and never try us. No? And you want to see how much aligned the phase is across trials in one condition or in the other. But in our case, instead of having correct and incorrect, so here is like the, what, I, what I'm saying. So we're using like a inter-trial phase coherence. Inter-trial phase coherence basically detects what is the alignment of multiple signals in multiple frequency bands. And if you have like a high alignment, so all the signals are in phase, basically the distribution in the, in the, in the circular plot uh, is going to be like pretty narrow, and I get a high score that can get, get up to one. If uh, all the phases are dispersed, um, I get uh, a low score that goes down uh, to zero. Uh, so we completed that, but instead of having like correct and incorrect, we have fast and slow. Okay? So again, we split the trials in the median, and we computed inter-trial phase coherence. What we find is that in fast trial, a specific uh, set of like, frequencies that, that go from like more or less 5, 3.55 to 7, 8 hertz, seems to be much, much, much more aligned across the trials than in a slow trial. Now, if you make the difference, in inter trial phase coherence. Do you guys understand how to make this plot? This is like time. In this case, we're like uh, aligning to uh, action initiation or somewhere there. Uh, and in, on the, on the y-axis, we have like hertz. So we have like at what frequency we're looking at this. And the color is how much the phase is consistent across trials in one condition and the other. Okay? And now, if you make a difference, you see that like before Actual initiation is pretty much in the moment of action initiation. We have like much higher consistency of phase in the theta ring, right? Now, this is something that I know it's slightly abstract to look at it like this. So uh, this is like a more comprehensible uh, way to look at it. This is like an example of one patient. Now, uh, action is like pretty much action initiation is pretty much here. Uh, what you see if you put together all the fast trials and you filter them in this specific frequency range, uh, so basically you get like only the oscillatory part in the theta range, is that you see that here there's like, you, you can actually reconstruct the oscillation, right, if you make the mean of the signals. This means that the signals are aligned, right? And if you compute the phase, you see this uh, SOTUS, right? Do you remember the Volo study where they show like the SOTUS in correct trial? that is actually lost in slow trials. And in fact, here we have that, if you make the mean, you get that pretty much like a flat signal. Okay. So this means that all the trials here are like more aligned than, than, than in here. So the like theta seems to be. Uh, so you have only the phase alignment when they make a decision, and after and before that, there's like, when the rotation. Yeah, so uh, of course, now, like what we're, this is like example of one this is like the mean of all the patients. Uh, so here's like uh, pretty much like action initiation. Uh, what you would expect is that at some point between Q uh, presentation and action initiation, the let's put them oscillators that are generating the signals are getting in sync. Okay. So of course, like the yellow here is like when they're like maximally synced, you know, but. Um, if you then look at the variability between individual patients, like, they get seen more or less rapidly. And this is something that, uh, very nice point that you're bringing up, is that um, you see, this is like a little bit speculative because I don't have enough data, you see desynchronization rising earlier for patients that have a more frontal data. So we have one that has uh, uh, almost pre-SMA, that is like sits right in front of SMA. And that's something that rises like much earlier than the, the other patients. So this means like in my purely speculative interpretation of this, there could be some sort of like theta oscillatory signal that in the same fashion of, um, of the, the, the study from a, a voltage, so somehow percolates from the frontal, more frontal areas to more the motor areas. No? So you have like a synchronization swipe or something like that. That's how I imagine. Okay. Um, so, do you guys have other questions? Yes. 
So to hit degree, we think that what you're observing here is uh, causal in the sense that it's actually causing the effect of uh, synchronization rather than being indicative of the fact that it's, uh, synchronization takes place. Right? So a uh, neuron cannot uh, call a signal signal into a, like, a byte and send this byte and with a static thing, it needs to do this with repeated bursts. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a stable representation, they're going to be periodic bursts. Uh, if uh, neurons link together into some global representation, then these uh, bursts will be synchronized, right? If you uh, come to a decision, it means that uh, some areas will be synchronized because they, in order to represent that thing, they need to fire at the same time, right? They need to form a piece of representation. So when you look at the thing, you will observe that uh, you have distinct uh, waves traveling around, and at some point, they seem to be happening at the same time. But this is not what's causing these things to do this, but rather it's uh, the <coughs> emerging pattern over the underlying computations, right? Yeah. Is this the perspective that you're having, or do you attribute, um, you attribute causal powers to the waves? I cannot attribute causal power to the waves. So I think there are like uh, at least three answers that I would like to give you here. Uh, the first one is like, I'm not trying to attribute a causal power to the waves, because I think Waves are, in fact, uh, um, more like a level of description rather than an actual mechanism in the brain. That's our way to look at it. You know? But our way to look at it, it means that, like, ultimately, these waves are produced by like some couple of oscillators, like, for example, parameter neurons in the in the in the SMEs. And if we see this, it means that like neurons somehow are encoding something, you know, pretty much at the, at the same time. Now, one measure that has been typically used like, to, as so probably Dani has, has mentioned, uh, to, to look at like, encoding in the different frequency bands, etc., is like the story of like, the theta gamma code. Right? So, looking at like, you have like, bursts of activity, they are like, synced in uh, theta cycles. You know? And this has been shown like, in especially in memory, you know, that like, different Theta cycles, depending where you get the bursts, you know, can hold like different items in memory. So this is a, um, something that I would like to expect to see. Uh, I, 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 would, I would like to see also in this data, and I think I have like a hint for this data. So this is like the type of coding that I would expect. Now, of course, I cannot give like a causal interpretation to this um, because I cannot manipulate these ways. Uh, so all I can offer is like a correlations uh, to some uh, level of strength. Um, of course, uh, one way to look at the causal relationship between this and, and behavior is like uh, using perhaps theta bursts in TMS. This is like uh, also a question that I made like to Mark the other way. It's like, do you guys stimulate in theta in the middle from the cortex? And if you see like an beneficial effect in terms of cognitive control, right? Because like for addiction, this is like the crucial. You know, if you want to stimulate like the executive network, you know, to inhibit prepotent um, uh, impulses, you know, that maybe would be a way to do it. You know? And this could somehow like uh, provide a sort of causal interpretation whether these uh, ways are indeed creating like or enforcing the system in some specific way, like some degree of synchronization. Um, but it seems that like a uh, different cortex, like for some probably like anatomical wiring, seems like to um, operate in the in the theta uh, in the theta range. So this is like something that you, you typically see also like in other studies. You know? like it's, a, it's, a, it's a operating mode somehow of the of the different cortex. Now regarding cross frequency coupling, that's something I'm going to talk uh, uh, about in a few slides. So uh, to say that. This is not just specific like, to, to theta oscillations, but it also involves other frequencies. So, and then I will try to speculate what is the role of this, of this relationship. Does it answer the question? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, I have more esoteric questions if you want. Yeah. I mean, how many uh, dimensions do these waves oscillate in? Um, you mean in how many? So this is basically a one-dimensional uh, projection of the wave, right? And uh, you, if something is a wave, it means there's a rotation going on, right? That you unravel in time. Mm -hmm. And you can construct rotations in uh, 2D and in 4D and in 8D. Uh, yeah, I understand what you mean. I, I don't know how to answer this. Okay. Yeah. 
I get what you mean like that. Well, so yeah. The base that you get what I mean. Thank you. <laughs> You just need a deformation. Okay. No, no. Uh, I was wondering whether somebody was thinking about this. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> dummy, like, did, did you understand? Uh, no, it looks easy. No, I can, you can, you can, you can look at like a symmetric factor and say, okay, in a no, but there's word. A simple, but there's a simple, at least starting point to look it up. Because in, in an abstract sense, we often look at neurons as intrinsically oscillating, or neural circuits as intrinsically oscillating. Right? So that sort of anchors your view on the oscillatory patterns that you see, and how higher or lower dimensional they, they can be. Right? So, so if you would unpack this LFP signal that you have, you would see this as, as an, an average across many oscillatory responses yeah. that you find in the neurons. Right? So, so this is at least a way to start to, to look at that question. Um, I'm not aware of anyone trying to put an dimensionality to that. I never came across that. No. Mm -hmm. Not. Uh, but it would be a good way to spend yeah. small. Yeah. Maybe it's a, actually a very good way to go, actually, in a sense. Uh, we, we should have. I will ask you one thing later. That's a lunch discussion. discussion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, or yeah. an upper discussion. Mm -hmm. You choose. Uh, you guys have a question in the back? No? Uh, and, and yeah, yes. Yeah. What do you mean by the Uh, I hear all of that out there, but I can't get the gamma. Can you crank it up a bit, uh, Daniel? Yeah, it's more like a question for Josh, right? I mean, these discussion, sorry, I was just wondering what you <laughs> refer to with the dimensionality of, uh, of the data. I mean, uh, the amount of frequency resolution you can you can uh, the data in, or uh, was it another? <coughs> Um, when you see a base, you are looking at a periodic process, right? Something is moving to a state space, and uh, in, a, in a regular way, right? So uh, a way of projecting this is to say it performs some kind of a rotation, right? So you are revisiting states regularly, and then you can think of this rotation taking place in a space of a certain dimensionality. And uh, you can think of rotation as things that happen in 2D, and that's because uh, the rotations that we see in two dimensions and three dimensional are all two dimensional. Right? When you see something rotating in 3D, it's moving in some around an axis. And uh, but there are rotations in 4D, for instance, a smoke rate such as thing that rotates around the circle. So uh, there are more complex rotations uh, between you are uh, moving regularly through a space in several dimensions. And what could that mean for neurons? It could mean that they encode several layers of connectivity in that oscillation pattern, right? So the yeah. signal moves to a higher dimensional space. But there is a limit to what Mahomet dimension can do So uh, then it becomes interesting, we can start to analyze what's going on there. So, but I think we're not assessing, I mean, with these methods of decomposition, we're not really going to add up the dimension. No, no, no. It's very I mean, it's very complex numbers. Yeah, yeah. But three or four. Okay, I mean, I think it's uh, extremely good. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, okay, do you, guys, do you guys have like clear or less what's going on here? Um, synchronized upper trials, non synchronized upper trials. Um, so, fast and slow. Now, uh, it's well, it's it's there's, there's periodicity, no? Huh? There's periodicity. Uh, yeah, periodicity, yes, uh, in time, but uh, if you look at the, so this is like an average of the signals, right? So now if you make an average of signals that are like in phase, you reconstruct like the oscillation, on this is like what is quantified by the uh, intertrial uh, phase coherence. Uh, if they are desynchronized, you basically just get that. Like, sure, but, but you see a periodic alignment in the fast trials, and you don't see that in the slow trials. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, um, a very important point that you have like, to solve when uh, you are uh, working with the uh, phase coherence is that um, you have to make sure that like uh, power or amplitude don't show uh, similar effects. Uh, because although, like in, in principle, in theory, like amplitude and phase are, are not uh, uh, are independent. 
it turns out that uh, there are like specific artifacts that can be introduced by the seduction. Also, if signals are more aligned, and you have like more power in one than the other, then you would also expect to see like more synchronization in one signal than the other. So it's like pretty much something that's called you know, induced synchronization. Uh, so it's not a very, uh, it's not a real phase reset. It's something that's just induced by an abrupt change in the system in the other. Okay. So is that a control that we made? So if you take like the power uh, of a fast and slow trials, here we have like something uh, that leaks like from the very low frequencies, it's like the transform of the motor above potential that sits more or less at one hertz. Uh, but you see that like higher up, uh, you don't get like any change, it's like a z-score. If you make the difference between fast and slow, you basically get a uh, green map. Okay, so it means that there's no difference between these. So uh, you see like, we have a synchronization here, no power. So things are resetting for me. <laughs> I, but I hope. Uh, of course, like, uh, and, and the, next, the next thing that the one would ask, like, if I were uh, you guys from Rome, uh, I would start being skeptical on the fact that you're saying, like, yeah, you are looking at the continuous measure, uh, that is a like response time, you know, but at the end you're just collapsing stuff into classes, right? And this is a little bit of a sort of, um, let me know the, the, the best way to, to look at it. No? So if you really want to like strengthen like, the message, you know, and, and, and really want to try to convince us that this is important like, for, for behavior, that you should somehow find the relationship on a continuous scale. Right? Now, to do that, uh, we did something that is like um, it's a little bit of a twist. Uh, we deducted single trial coherence. So, inter trial phase coherence is uh, by definition an average measure because you are doing it across trial, you know, and then you look at what is uh, somehow like the average phase you know, across this trial. And now you get like one value per <coughs> group. And then basically you lose trials, you know, this average. But now what you can do is really deduct the contribution of individual trials to the total synchronization. This basically you compute the total trial synchrony, so the total trial, so you, you basically do that for all the trials, so you get like one time frequency map within the trial phase coherence. And then you make another one where you do it for all the trials minus one trial. Okay? And then you subtract these two maps. And what you get is the contribution of one that individual trial that you subtracted to the overall. Okay? And this is a, a method from Jarvis and Nita, if you guys are interested. Um, and basically, you look, it's, a, it's a pseudo value that you, that you take from that. Now, we get, like, we go back to the trials, so we re-chew back like, the, 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 the trials, so from this, and now we get, like, uh, a, for each trial, we get a time frequency map with uh, the individual contribution to the topic coherence, that is like, so for each one of these time frequency beams, I have, so for each time frequency time, Frequency beam, I get one single trial here, right? And I do it for all the trials. And now what I'm going to do is to try to okay, take for each trial, I lock the time frequency beam, so I say, okay, this time this frequency, I take the single trial coherence of every trial, and I try to relate that value with response time, okay? And then I get a correlation coefficient out of this. Does it make sense? Yes? So, is it, is it clear, like, what I'm, gonna, what I'm doing here? So I'm trying to relate, like, synchrony, synchrony that typically is across trials, now I deduct like, the individual trial contribution, I try to relate it with behavior, okay? <coughs> what we get is something like this. So, this map is a time frequency map of Rs, okay? Yes? Can I ask you about this prima correlation point? So each point in the, in the correlation is complete. <coughs> Uh, can you explain better the, the meaning of the point on the, on the correlation? I mean, okay, we are correlating the reaction time, that's one number per trial, isn't it? One number per trial, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. with, with, with okay. the single trial coherence at one specific time frequency beam. Then now I have, like, let's say at uh, one one, huh? I get, like, only one one for every trial. Okay. And I put them here. No? 
And then I ask, how that specific frequency beam correlates with response time? Okay? So if I do this for all the time frequency beams, basically for one trial, huh? every graph correction time versus the, the index is. These are, these are triads. Oh, okay, so yes. one, one trial. Exactly. I take like each one of these little squares, one time frequency beam. I take that time frequency beam for across all the trials, and I relate with the response time. Okay, of that trial. The, the number of entries is the number of trials. Hmm? The number of entries in the graph is the number of the triads. Uh, in here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These are triads. Okay. But then what I'm going to show later is a time frequency flow with R squares, okay? <coughs> that is the R squares that I'm getting from, oops, correlating in individually, like each one of these right. Does it make sense? Okay. Um, we're almost done. Huh? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so now you can look at the R square, now that you extracted from this analysis, and basically what you see is that, um, so this is again frequency, this is time, the blues are the <coughs> negative R's correlation. It means is where that time frequency beam has a negative correlation with response time. Right? When you see red is a positive correlation, when you see green is pretty much the same. Okay? So this is telling us on a continuous scale what are the frequencies and at what point in time they contribute to the final motor performance. Okay? Now, of course, like if you just do this, like, no one would believe you, so you have like, to do some statistical analysis that we have like, to come up with, but it's based on uh, 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 permutation analysis. It's something that if you then are interested, I can uh, explain you how to do that, but basically you know, like, shuffle stuff and prove that this stuff doesn't happen at random. Okay? And that you get, our, like, what you get are like, slots uh, or clusters, as one of the earlier. Uh, uh, fine. Now, last step of the analysis. Uh, important, like something that uh, Joshua was like somehow alluding at earlier, or this what I understood, um, is looking at uh, the specific cross frequency relationship between uh, the phase of teeth oscillations and higher frequencies. So this type of analysis, of course, is a uh, so we are. Uh, I, from an electrophysiological perspective, I consider our lab pretty much a hippocampal lab because there's like a lot of strong personality in in the. So I'm very much influenced by uh, the theta gamma coding, etc., etc. Uh, but we also know now that, like from these uh, uh, more recent studies, that uh, theta gamma code might be also involved in uh, in, uh, in frontal circuits. So this is like a type of analysis that. Uh, we had to do to try to assess whether um, the, the phase of teeth oscillations were perhaps in training the high frequency oscillations. Now, high frequency oscillations are typically taken as more like a local population activity, okay? Because they are higher and therefore they are like more uh, localized, while right? like low frequencies tend to uh, be uh, emerging like, from oscillators that are like tackled in a, uh, let's say, a larger scale. Now, what we did here is like a phase amplitude coupling is what I was explaining to you before. It's like a, this stuff, okay? So it's like amplitude modulation. Uh, and uh, what the, the, the assumption in, uh, in phase amplitude coupling is that if you have like a low frequency phase that is modulating a high frequency amplitude, and now you take the um, phase and you try to plug the amplitude on, over the phase, if the uh, two pieces of signal, or the two frequencies are coupled, uh, you get a non-uniform distribution. If they are coupled, you get a uniform distribution. If they are, sorry, if they are not coupled, you get a uniform distribution. If they are coupled, you get a non-uniform one. Okay? Does it make sense? It's just like, this is like just a random relationship. No, it's like, it's flat. This one is not random because it has specific shapes. So, uh, the, there are various, like, for example, the company measures, like, they're pretty much looking at this, no? like, what is the relationship between one and the other. Now, we computed this um, for our patients, so let's see, uh, so I'm going to get you through this plot. Um, we know what are the significant uh, 
phase resets where they are in what frequency band, right? Because this is like the analysis that we've done before. We know that phase resets happen in, t in theta. So now we are going to restrict our analysis of the phase part of the analysis. So we're taking the phases in the theta band that we found significant. And now we swipe up to all the amplitude of the higher frequencies. No? So we want to see the hour t that we found significant with what it couples higher in the in the frequency spectrum. Okay? So this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing like the coupling of the theta that we found significant for every patient with the amplitude modulated of all the higher frequencies. Okay? We take the the two group of trials, so fast and slow trials, we compute all the coupling from theta to all the higher frequencies, and then we subtract one from the other, and we look at the difference. Okay? Now, this is the difference of fast trials minus slow trials in phase amplitude coupling of theta with respect to all the higher frequency amplitudes. Okay? Now, the yellow mountains here are significant <coughs> differences. No? Basically, here there is a line that defines what is the 95 uh, percent confidence interval that we extract from the data, and this world is above that. Okay? So what this shows is that for in fast trials, we have significantly higher phase amplitude coupling that falls in the low gamma range. Is that clear? <coughs> yes. So um, this, in some sense, alludes at the idea that it's not just phase success, but it's the coupling of the oscillations, so the carrier wave and the carrier wave that seems to be encoding some message in the theta gamma code that might be, in fact, uh, uh, modulating behavior. So, with that one, yesterday we were speculating, and this is like the last very take home message, I just have a conclusion slide after this. She said, if we look at, this is action initiation, right? So you remember that yesterday we were talking about this idea of like um, um, random fluctuations in the system. You know? um, and the fact that if I happen to be in an up state, I will cross the threshold faster. If I happen to be in a low state, I will cross the threshold, threshold slow. Now, the way I think we should imagine like our data in this regard is like, if we assume that the theta gamma code here is carrying like a specific uh, cognitive control signal that travels in some theta gamma coupled oscillation, so like something like this, and this message is somehow like sequential, then what I could expect is that if the message gets in the right phase, then action is going to be issued like earlier. If it gets like another phase, then we will have to wait for some more time. So this means like, this raises the question, is action always locked to a preferential phase? Because if that was the case, this could mean that uh, perhaps like in this specific oscillatory pattern, we have a specific type of information that when it gets to the right moment in the SMA, can elicit the, the motor response. Now, um, we don't have an answer for this. Uh, this will require like, further analysis, like pretty much like looking at pre preferential phases uh, distributed over response time, no? and we would expect perhaps to see, since we have like more consistency across phases, maybe they also have like preferential phase in a specific phase of the oscillation when actions are faster, with, with respect to when actions are slower. So they will be more dispersed. But this is something that uh, I guess we will not be able to answer now, so it's just like a, a speculation. A few conclusions. Uh, human SMAs uh, seems to be in charge for switching between automatic and deliberate actions. Uh, and the phase of theta frequencies seems to be directly implicated in the control of switching behavior. Of course, I've shown you correlation, so I don't have like a real causal answer to this. Uh, this, I guess, is uh, work for a few studies. Uh, now, the phase synchrony is what I was uh, saying earlier. Is like 
It could be a, a mean of long-range communication between functional networks, and this will be so in the Voltex study, uh, but it also could carry a specific message that sets the action parameter to the theta gamma code. And this alludes uh, to the theta gamma code that we see in the theta gamma. Um, in uh, general terms, I think that these results are uh, somehow uh, uh, important because they really try to relate oscillatory, oscillatory dynamics with behavior at a very, very, very detailed and, uh, and high, high resolution. But as I said, the single trial level. It's something that you don't see. You don't see that. Now, uh, before concluding, I would like to thank all the people uh, involved in this study. Uh, Paul, Claudia, <laughs> where she for the endless discussions. Uh, and everybody else, also our uh, patients, uh, and of course, had the map that allowed us to run this great stuff. Thank you very much. All right, so, so I think this is as close as we can get to the language of the brain, right, in some sense. Um, and now we have to unpack that because we're not really there yet. Right? So, uh, are there questions for Giovanni? So, but Giovanni, you have one thing you have to explain to us. And this also goes back to the discussion we had earlier. Because in the end, we want to all think really about the mechanism, right? We want to really think about okay, how do these pyramidal neurons in M1 in the end initiate that movement, mm -hmm. right? And those are nerves fighting. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so how, how do you envision that this that transformation? Because this is really an echo of, if you want, huge amounts of people talking, like it's a football yeah, stadium. Yeah. You have the microphone in the football stadium, right? And now, yeah, yeah, it's also very right? So, yeah. we don't even know what the individuals are doing. Yeah, you have, this is a consensus, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you see this mapping now happen? How do you see this mapping really happening to the driving the individual pyramidal cells in the primary cortex that actually make you switch to the target location? Um, you mean in terms of like circuit in the mechanism, the mechanism of the so think about the mechanism of also the underlying signals of this, right? What are the people in the stadium really saying to each other? What they are saying really to each other is, uh, I guess you know, but so there is like a, a nice. Uh, of course, they know what they're saying to each other. Opinion taker. They say Real Madrid sucks. <laughs> so say. I, I think it's. A, is that what they say to each other? Huh? No, these are the reference, uh, like if you guys want to look it up. Uh, uh, this guy is like uh, one of the main guys that is involved in the Tita Gamma, uh, the, sorry, the frontal Tita business, uh, has seemed to have like a, at least a speculative hypothesis of what is the mechanistic implementation of this. So, um, in this prior. Uh, I gave you a chance to appropriate it now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's fair to say that this is not. A, with our speculation that we're like working in a, in a context, right? Then you might believe this or not. But basically, like when we look at the uh, coupling of like pyramidal neurons, like what you uh, so in EG studies, you tend to see like a much more of a um, power uh, in theta that seems to coincide like, uh, or, or be involved like, in a cognitive control. And this is something that you record typically like at the uh, Surface, so uh, layer one and two, um, because here is where, like, um, let's say, different like, sensory inputs are like, converged uh, into uh, one specific area, uh, and this uh, speculatively leads like, to an increase of power. Now, <coughs> there is like some coupling between these neurons. So basically, what you get down certain, at the output layer is like some sort of like synchronization. Whenever things are like enter more synchronized, you know, then they give rise to like, specific like, oscillatory patterns, you not know, that are scattered oscillators. But these low frequencies are also like coupled with like uh, longer range connections to other oscillators that uh, we get in here that can be like you know, in different you know? So um, uh, it's something that I think it's important to notice because um, when you, uh, this can also explain like, the difference that we see in a, a, our setup that is more like a, in, intracranial, so we're really like 
probably, I do not exactly what layer we're looking at, uh, but uh, definitely not uh, scalpel, it's probably like maybe around here. Uh, while each scalp is tend to look at the very surface, and also they pick uh, something that is more easy. So what I think is that um, there is a, perhaps like a dissociation between uh, amplitude and phase, in the sense that um, phase, what we're tracking right now uh, is more, as, as I said, like a synchronization scene. Um, so this means like when these populations are more <coughs> entrained, so there is more consensus and less variability in, in the signal, this means that like the, the, um, uh, the system runs fast. And this is something that is coherent also with the, uh, uh, in is not here anymore, right? Uh, but in Kapp 2011, uh, neuron paper, okay. 13 paper, Precisely showed, like, from a slightly different perspective, that um, if you have like a, a cortical population, in this case, intramotor cortex, you know, that has been exposed to previous errors, you know, therefore, like things have not coincided. Imagine you have like much higher variability. You know, that uh, it means like you get like less coupling you know, between these, and you basically get like more noise, and the system runs slow. You know? Because this is like the point. Now, if you have less variability, then the system runs fast. So I think in terms of like mechanistic explanation, it's not uh, much of a magic. You know? We're just talking about like coupling of like many many oscillators. And of course, uh, you can also expect like a directionality um, in the coupling of these oscillators. You know? And this is something that uh, there is this. Uh, I think it's Zan. It's a neuron paper from 2018 where they are really looking at this concept of like traveling ways to the concept to the uh, cortex, no? where they are somehow speculating that um, waves are like traveling directionally, no? so you have like this low um, uh, traveling like oscillatory patterns no? that are entrained sequentially mm -hmm. uh, activities in the system. But this is this is correct, right? Because in some of this also means, especially for uh, people in the audience, you could really speculate that the kinds of oscillatory patterns you see are actually really close to what the coding substrate is of the system, right? That is really yeah. driving and causing the behavior, right? Yeah. So, so because also if you look at these at signal, the signal nerds cannot do much more than fall into oscillatory patterns. Yeah, exactly. And by virtue of the circuits they're in. Of course. Right? So we're really very, very, very close. To the, the language of the brain, if you want, right? So, so this is not anymore just a very coarse averaging, if you want. No, no, we're really very close to to how the brain is causing behavior. I think that makes this kind of work really very exciting. Any other questions for Giovanni? Otherwise, we thank Giovanni for a great presentation.